Okay, you're welcome back. Uh, delighted to say, do we have him yet? No, we don't. We'll be joined in a moment by the Minister for Health, Simon Harris. We've just got word he'll take a call, so we'll bring you all the very latest from him in just one moment. If you're tuning in, it seems the government uh, will be recommending that the Ireland-Italy Six Nations game does not go ahead. This is uh, due to ongoing fears over the coronavirus. Um, Simon Harris was speaking about an hour ago now, so this is all just breaking has said uh, it was the very clear view of the National Public Health Emergency Team that the game should not go ahead and he said the department will be contacting the IRFU to convey this ahead of the game. Was scheduled for the 7th of March. The expectation was that 5,000 Italian fans were expected to travel to Dublin and the IRFU said it would be guided by the Irish government's uh, wishes. I'm told now Simon Harris is with us. Uh, you're there, Minister Harris? I am indeed. Good evening, Joe. Thanks for joining us. So uh, I know you're talking maybe in the last hour or so. You might just reiterate the point, the uh, clear advice from the National Public Health Emergency Team on the uh, Ireland-Italy game. Yeah, look, I know it'll come as a source of massive disappointment to, to rugby fans and sports fans in general, but it probably won't come as that great a surprise that with the developments we've seen in Italy in the last uh, number of days and indeed hours, We've now added uh, Northern Italy to the affected regions list uh, for public health purposes. So therefore, in all conscience, you couldn't have a situation whereby you'd be hosting uh, a major rugby game in Dublin on the 7th of, uh, on the 7th of March uh, with an effect encouraging people to travel from an affected region. So sadly, um, we've had to take the advice that the uh, match should be postponed. Um, and obviously, it's a matter for the IRFU now to engage in that regard. I, I, I presume they'll fully go along with the advice. It makes perfect sense. That said, are the IRFU obliged to take that advice? Is that is that the matter closed now? It's off. To be to be very honest, I hope and don't expect we'll get into that space. Yeah. Um, I'm 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 sure if I'm sure if government needed to, it could. But in fairness to the IRFU, I don't I don't I don't sense uh, any response or reaction um, like that from them. I mean, I've I've very much seen their public statements in recent days where they're where they're talking about. Uh, following government advice, and of course, of course, everybody in relation to um, sports and sports fans will want to keep everybody safe. So I expect the IRFU will follow government advice, and indeed, I've heard them say that publicly. These are not decisions, and these are not decisions that are taken lightly uh, in any way. Mm. But public health obviously does need to trump um, every other consideration, and the idea that you'd be hosting a game in Ireland where you'd be encouraging other people into two games where you'd be encouraging other people to travel. Mm. Um, from an affected region um, would just not make sense from a public health point of view. OK, so that will also apply to the under-20s game against Italy and the women's game that weekend? Yes, it will. OK. So, yeah, like, I know there would have been generally going on, on previous games, maybe 5,000 Italian fans expected to travel to Dublin and mm -hmm. has, as has been made very clear over the last uh, 24 hours or so, several regions of Italy badly affected, over 200 people diagnosed, so 5,000 Italians rocking up to Dublin mightn't be the best idea. Was there any uh, possibility of playing the game behind closed doors or uh, somehow uh, getting in touch with the Italian Rugby Federation and saying, well, can, can we somehow uh, get in touch with the 5,000 fans planning and coming and say, this is, uh, you know, unfortunately not going to be possible, but, and in effect play the game in front of just the Irish fans. Is that, was, was that <laughs> contemplated? So I, is that possible? I mean, I, so I suppose all of those are matters for the IRFU. I mean, the only space, the only space I should be in as health minister as opposed to sports minister sure. uh, is, the public health, is the public health space. So the idea that, the idea of all the people, as you rightly say, travelling and being encouraged to travel from an affected region not being sensible, of course it's up to the IRFU mm. uh, to decide how best to deal with this. Uh, indeed, if they wish to come up with alternative arrangements, of course, these are matters we'll engage constructively uh, with the IRFU on. But um, I, mean, I mean, I should point out, for, for in general, this is not the first time we've seen a very significant uh, event globally have an impact on on sport in Ireland. When we were hosting, when we were hosting the Special Olympics uh, here in our own country, and um, we had a very significant outbreak of SARS, mm -hmm. and you'll probably remember, um, there were huge restrictions put on, on visitor activity and where the various teams could go and the likes as well. So sadly, um, sadly, this does happen from time to time. But I, I don't think anybody would thank the Irish authorities um, if, it, if it ignored um, mm. what is clear public health uh, advice no, um, just to no. ensure a game could be played. No, absolutely. Look, sport is sport. People's health is absolutely the priority here. And where are we generally in terms of flights in and out of Italy, you know, away from sport at the moment? 
Yeah, so like there is not, and I mean, I suppose this is an interesting point and an important point. I mean, there is not a travel ban in place. So we all live in the European Union. Uh, there's free movement of people across the Union. It's something people value very much. But what is happening with individual um, countries is they're obviously putting in travel advisories for their members. So we're now advising people in Ireland not to make on any unnecessary travel to the affected regions, which now includes uh, northern Italy. It also includes so places like Singapore, South Korea, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Iran. Uh, and China, of course, as well. Mm. Uh, and obviously the Italians are taking their own measures in terms of providing advice to their citizens in relation to travel. So whilst there's not a travel ban in place and we're not stopping flights coming in, obviously citizens are being sensible in terms of listening to their own Department of Foreign Affairs. I mean, nobody wants to get sick and nobody wants to spread a virus. Yeah, this is a very difficult thing to, to, to stop. And mm. um, Unfortunately, we're seeing an awful lot of it now emerging in clusters uh, in Europe, particularly initially. And I think there's a responsibility on all of us citizens just I suppose to use common sense here uh, and to follow the advice of our own Department of Foreign Affairs. COC Italy has uh, issued advice to its own citizens in terms of travel and we're issuing advice uh, to ours along a similar line. And are travel bans likely? I think travel bans will always be a very last resort in the European Union. I mean it's built very much on the principle of free movement um, but I think what, what you are likely to see is travel advisories where you will be advised not to travel to certain regions. So that has become kind of widely accepted at this stage in relation to mainland China uh, for the last number of weeks, yeah. uh, not just in Ireland, but right across the European Union. I suppose the steps we've taken today and the steps I expect to be taken at a European level in the coming hours will be to expand the list of affected regions well beyond China. So I think a, I think a legal ban is unlikely. Uh, but what's much more likely is that citizens will be advised against travel. And look, all of the experience tends to show when you advise your citizens against travelling to an area in their, own, in their own interest, in the interest of their own health and public health, yeah. people usually abide by that. OK, listen, I know you're a busy man. Just a final broad point. Uh, any experts I hear on the radio of late are of the opinion that we will see cases in Ireland. There's a certain inevitability about that. The hope is that they can be treated and kept in isolation. This is a fast-moving story. What are we anticipating from an Irish point of view over the next week, 10 days? Yeah, look, I think you're entirely right. I mean, if we were having this conversation about a week ago, I would have been telling you that 99% of cases of this virus had so far been in China. Uh, the situation now is that 97% of cases have now been in China. So the overwhelming amount is now in China and remains in China. But the advice from the European disease centres has now changed. And they're now basically saying that there's a high likelihood that you will see clusters uh, in the European Union. And yes, it's highly likely we will see a case in Ireland uh, in the coming days or weeks. Mm. And that doesn't mean the measures we've taken or the measures the European Union have taken uh, have failed. Um, containment is about trying to reduce the number of cases and reduce the likelihood of cases uh, rather than actually being able to stop them all. So I, I would not be in any way surprised, uh, nor would our health authorities, um, if there were cases. And indeed, that's, that they've been preparing for that reality since January. It is important to say, because I'm conscious that people are hearing an awful lot of information here. I mean, the symptoms of this are, are common cold and flu-like symptoms, so fevers and the likes. If people are looking for information, they should go to hse.ie, where there's quite a lot of information outlined there. And look, it is also important to say that the mortality rate is around 2%. Well, it's obviously very sad and devastating when people die of this condition. The mortality rate is about 2%. So from a public health point of view, it's just important to get those facts out as well. OK. Simon Harris, thanks so much. Much appreciated. Thanks, Joe. Good to chat to you. Bye. Uh, Simon Harris there. Peter O'Reilly of the Sunday Times listening in. Hi, Peter. Hey, Joe. How's it going? Very well. So it's 2001 all over again. The Italian match is effectively off there. I mean, Simon Harris did not immediately shoot down the, the possibility of maybe this match going ahead without the Italian fans. But I suspect, I don't know if you've heard either way, I suspect the IRFU will take the advice in full. Um, well, there's no word from the IRFU just yet. As you know, earlier in the day they were trying to allay fears. Um, I was in contact with someone in the, the Irish camp uh, and they've heard nothing official yet. That, that was only a few minutes ago. Right. Um, but, you know, a matter of public health, Minister of Health, etc., etc. Um, I suppose there would be a bit of um, lobbying going on for the for for that suggestion that you made there. There might be, according to one travel agent I spoke to, there would be maybe two thousand Italian fans kind of due over for that game. Right. So you could have a situation where they may be asked not to travel and the, the game might go ahead. But maybe we're clutching at straws there. I don't know. Yeah, and then obviously England have to go to Rome in the final round of the championship. So 
this whole thing suddenly all a, a, a bit up in the air. I don't suppose we could just say to the Italians, can we both have five points and let's maybe just, you know, go with that. Yeah, that would go down well, I'd imagine, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so, I, I, well, I wonder then, in, in 01 it was September that the foot and mouth games ultimately were played, wasn't it? Yeah, um, remember it well. It was the first season of the, um, of the Celtic League, uh, 01-02. Um, so it, it, was, it was a much different landscape back then, Joe. It's nearly, nearly 20 years ago. Mm. Um, the Celtic League, which is now the Pro 14, it was a much smaller affair. So there were gaps in the calendar. Um, you know, the professional game was still very, uh, very young at that stage. So uh, Ireland had to get games in uh, in Edinburgh, in Cardiff, and then uh, we played England in the final game at home, which was... Uh, Everybody remembers as the day that we spo uh, the Ireland spoiled England's Grand Slam. Mm. Um, but yeah, slightly more innocent times. Um, and as I say, there were, there were more gaps in the calendar at that stage. We're currently in the middle of the most cluttered season on record because it's a, a Rugby World Cup season. Mm. So the logistics involved in rescheduling a couple of games uh, in the Six Nations are, oh, God, it's, it's, it's uh, horrible to think about. Yeah. And even thinking off the top of my head here, say France go to Murrayfield, win. Say France beat Ireland in Paris, Grand Slam done, competition effectively over regardless of what England do in Rome or Ireland do at home to Italy. Then there's an argument, is there a, a, a pointlessness to these games? And I suspect the answer from the RFU and the Italian Federation, particularly the RFU who will want the, the, the gate receipts and maybe broadcasters yeah. as well, is yeah. the game goes ahead and then I don't know how much appetite there is for an utterly meaningless Ireland-Italy game in August, September time. So, uh, a real mess. It is a, it is a real mess, Joe. Um, but that, that um, set of circumstances that you outlined there is uh, it's perfectly possible. Um, France would be would, would go to go to Edinburgh as favourites, and and they'll be favourites against Ireland as well in the final game. Mm. So, um, but for the integrity of the competition, you've got to try and get those fixtures in. You know, there are enough asterisks beside 2001 as it is. That this would be even more complicated uh, if we went down that route. Okay. Well, listen, thanks so much for joining us. I suspect you'll be working on a 2001 nostalgia feature in the Sunday Times uh, very soon. <laughs> so, uh, thanks so much, Peter. Appreciate it. Cheers, Joe. Thanks. Cheers. Peter O'Reilly there of the Sunday Times. So, there you have it from Simon Harris himself. The uh, firm advice to the RFU will be game does not go ahead. They may. They may. We don't know. They may entertain uh, some possibility if the RFU push for it of a game with no Italian fans. How enforceable that is. I don't know, so we will. He, he didn't shoot it down though straight away, did he? Simon Harris, no, he didn't. He said, "I'm not the minister for sport, but this is the medical advice." Um, he's probably not too sure how realistic an aim it is to prevent the Italian fans from travelling. Peter Riley, interestingly, there saying two thousand as opposed to five thousand. Maybe there is a way. Uh, I'm sure the Six Nations will be saying, "If there's any way, we yeah, can just I get mean, this played." I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility. Not at all. I think it's it's quite reasonable. It's only 2,000 come from Italy and then maybe I don't know, a couple of thousand from that are already here or coming from uh, well, They're here around. anyway. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see. The IRFU have yet to comment. We'll bring it to you at any stage. Obviously keep you updated. A uh, short break then Damien's going to give us some thoughts on the Champions League tonight. Off the ball on News Talk. Nissan is launching their brand new way to drive a brand new car. Nissan Subscribe and Drive is here. Simply choose the car you want, choose two or three years and pay a monthly subscription fee. No deposit, no fuss, no 